All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you guys are stuck at home, so we are so happy you could join us live on YouTube. And we've got a live family with us. We're expecting a couple more over the next few minutes as well. Before we dive into our official presentation, I want to turn it over to Michelle at Canadian Geographic. She's going to highlight some of their amazing educational programs for you guys at home. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Michelle, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today. It's really lovely to have you with us. I am a geographer um, and my main job at Canadian Geographic Education is to get Canadians excited about the natural places and the people and the history of our beautiful country. And so last year, my team and I had the opportunity to work with our guests of honor on today's session to create a one of a kind collection of learning materials that build on some of the incredible stories and photographs and video clips that you guys are gonna see in just a few moments. And so we called this the Anthropocene Education Program. And you can access it uh, by using the link that's going to be emailed to you and shared on YouTube. And you're also gonna get a link about our new online classroom, which has even more resources for you all to enjoy. And so I encourage everyone to check them out. Back to you, Jesse. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, uh, Michelle. And so, yes, the reason we are all here today, and we've got another group joining live, so welcome to them as well, is for the team behind the Anthropocene Project. So this is a multidisciplinary, multimedia body of work spanning, you know, augmented reality, film installations, virtual reality, all sorts of amazing uh, ways of highlighting human impact on this planet. Today, we are going to be focusing on extinction specifically, a very dark but a very pertinent topic, and I hope you guys are very keen to learn from uh, the team at the, at the Anthropocene Project. Thank you so, so much to Nick and Jen for joining us today, and I look very forward to hearing your story. Without further ado, take us away. Okay, hello. Thanks, Jesse, and hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I'm Nick, and this is Jennifer. We are documentary filmmakers and we are married and we've been making films for 25 years about all kinds of different subjects, but especially more recently about environmental topics, which um, we think uh, are one of the topics that really as a, as a society, as a, as a global community um, all around the world is something that we have as a challenge right now with a lot of problems that we we have to solve. And um, so as filmmakers, that's that's an interesting topic for us to to try and uh, capture and to uh, hope that these films and these things raise awareness about these topics. So we spent about four years going all around the world uh, on this project, which is called the Anthropocene. Um, and do you want to talk about the idea of what Anthropocene means? Just Sure. So what we were inspired by scientists, and there are a group of scientists who have been working for the past 13 years, gathering evidence of human impact on different systems of the earth on the planet. And what we have learned from them and their research is that we as a species, even though we have not been around very long, in terms of the whole history of the earth, um, we have had a massive, massive impact. And so we took all of their research and the categories of their research, and we thought, let's try to make this information accessible to ordinary people, people who are not scientists who have spent their whole you know, lives studying data and in labs, and let's try to make it come alive. And that's what the whole project was about, which was, as Jesse mentioned, a museum exhibition and a film and a couple of books and uh, the education program that Michelle talked about. So what you're seeing right now uh, is images from the trailer from the documentary that shows all kinds of different ways that um, people are affecting and impacting the planet. And that's all of our industry, all of our agriculture, how we change the surface of the planet um, through terraforming, mining, extraction, 
a lot of these things um, that we need to do to live the lives that we've become used to living, especially in the global north and in big cities, it requires a lot of um, uh, these activities that have an effect on nature and that have an effect on the planet. So we looked all around the world for images that would be examples of these things. And this last image here is one of the ones that we're gonna talk about today because one of the real hallmarks of the Anthropocene is um, species extinction. And that can happen for a lot of different reasons. But if you look at all of the biodiversity around the world, all of the incredible nature and animals and plants, because humans now uh, have such a dominant effect on the whole world, a lot of these systems are kind of in danger. And what that means is that specific species um, have a real challenge in some situations to survive. And the scientists tell us that it is super, super important um, that we try not to lose that biodiversity. That diversity of life is, is the strength of the planet. It's part of the web uh, that keeps all, all species alive, including our own. And so we really need to be careful about the impact of some of these practices. And um, one thing that it would be an interesting thought experiment before we talk specifically about species extinction. And, and part of that is when we talk about going into nature, you know, we say we're going to go for a hike, we're going to go for a hike in nature, or we're going to go for a canoe um, uh, ride, or we're going to go you know, out into nature, we make these forays from the city, those of us who live in, in the global north in urban environments, we say that's how we encounter nature. We go into that space and then we come back to our daily lives and go on as though the two things are separate. And in fact, every single thing we do every day in the city is taking from some natural landscape somewhere. The computer that I am speaking to you on right now has materials in it that have been extracted from all different places in the earth. The desk I'm sitting on has wood that has been harvested from a forest and on and on and on. The food that we eat comes from a landscape that probably once was wild but is now devoted to agriculture. And so one of the effects of all of that taking that we do every day quite unconsciously um, is that there's less and less habitat for species, for other species than our own. And habitat loss is one of the big issues that is driving extinction, as well as things like poaching, hunting, um, and, and, and human interaction with, with wild animals. But habitat loss is one of the biggest, and that is something that we want to talk about now because for me, this was the most heart-wrenching part of, of our whole project, was um, looking at and engaging with and witnessing the species that are struggling to survive. You want to show some of the, the scene from the species extinction, the montage? Sure. OK. Give me just one sec, guys, while I queue up a video. So one thing, another thing to think about is that we think of zoos um, as places where we go to see, you know, animals that are, you know, in, in, in captivity that are, are in captivity because uh, so we can see what they're like, we can see, you know, what these species look like. Um, uh, in fact, many contemporary zoos, most contemporary zoos, are actually at the forefront of species conservation. And the reason that they have these um, you know, exhibits like the London Zoo, where we are right now, is because it drives their conservation work. And we went to the Zoological Society of London precisely because they have such a strong conservation program. Um, and what you're about to see now are all of the animals, not all of them, but many of the animals in their care that they are trying to rehabilitate so they can be reintroduced into the wild. That was a Sumatran tiger. This, this is the northern white cheek gibbon. And 
You know, I, I will say that while there's something incredibly tragic and sad about all of these species um, that are either extinct in the wild or critically endangered, Herr David's deer is actually extinct in the wild, it doesn't exist in the wild anymore. One thing that was an incredibly hopeful, hopeful um, message to me was that the people around the world who are working with these species and helping them to survive are so devoted to this work. Um, and that was an incredible feeling of hope. This woman here is basically the mother of the mountain chicken frogs at the, at the London Zoo. She has been raising these babies for two years and then they will be taken back to the Caribbean, Caribbean which was their natural habitat that has been disrupted because of human pe people eat them and also because of climate change and um, climate catastrophe there. She will take them back into the wild. They'll live in a little tent at night. They'll get to go out a little bit in the day. Then they come back into the tent at night and slowly they will be reintegrated into the wild. And her commitment to these, this species was, was for us um, a very uplifting thing. Nick, do you want to talk about Sudan? Yeah, so if anyone um, was part of this morning's session on Old Pajetta, and I'm not sure if these are archived, but um, uh, this is actually where we filmed um, uh, uh, a number of uh, species, and especially the northern white rhino, uh, which is now functionally extinct. There were four, then three, and now only two. When we started the project, there were four, now there's only two left. Um, and that's an incredible story, but I, I know it's been covered. I think one of the important points that we really wanted to make when we were making the Anthropocene Project and this film was that um, we can no longer, uh, no matter where we live in the world, think, oh, that is a problem, but it's happening somewhere else. If the rhinos are going extinct, that's in Africa, somebody else is, is responsible, it's, it's not really our problem here. And I think the, the fact that we are now so many on this planet means that we are all intertwined, right? Um, we, we, uh, any, any problem, any solution, anything that happens um, is, is, can have global ramifications. And that can be very negative, but it can also be very positive. So if we think, boy, some of these problems are too challenging, I'm just one person, or it's a, a, I care about that, but it's far away, I think it's important to realize that we all actually can make a difference. And that can take lots of different forms, but that can be by changing our awareness and our practices just in our daily lives individually about, about how we shop, about how we care about um, waste that we throw out and how we do it, anything that can affect the environment positively can have an overall effect on a lot of these dynamics that, that can help, you know, that can help reverse the trend, the trends that are driving extinction. You know, we used to ship in, in Canada a lot of our recycling plastics and other things that put in, in our blue boxes and our municipal waste stream, we used to ship that all around the world for other people to kind of deal with. Um, and eventually uh, people around the world said, you know what, we kind of don't want your garbage anymore. Um, so you guys have to deal with that now. And, and those sorts of environmental uh, solutions that now we have to come up with because all of the plastic and things that we used to sort of get rid of and forget about, we now have to deal with, I think are really important. And we shouldn't underestimate their connection to things like species extinction, no matter where in the world. One of the most challenging things, this, this whole project took five years, and you can imagine that we were all over the world um, for this project. And one of the things that keeps me up at night even now is, is wondering whether all of the energy that we used to make this project was worth it in terms of the awareness that we're able to raise about these issues and our Whole project has been carbon offset, which when, is a way. When you of, say energy use, you mean? I mean 
carbon, I mean oil, I mean gas. We, I mean whenever we, we took an airplane, that takes a lot of of jet fuel to fly, and we were having to rent cars, just transporting ourselves and our equipment and our crew all around so, took up a lot of energy. So yeah, yeah. So you you've probably heard about people talking about your footprint, your your ecological footprint, and and I would say that the ecological footprint of this project is quite large, but uh, we tried to carbon offset it and calculate the amount of energy we used and then do something that would make that neutral, like planting a bunch of trees somewhere or investing in an alternative energy project somewhere. We have done that. However, um, one of the most challenging things was this filming this ivory tusk burn that you saw at the end of the trailer. And we're going to show a little bit of, 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 of the preparation for this burn. This, this is ivory that has been stockpiled by the Kenyan government for how many years was it, Nick? Decades. Decades yeah. and decades. And it was an incredible um, burden to have because they had to guard it 24 hours a day because poachers wanted to come and take it and sell it because there is still a market around the world for ivory illegal ivory and even though it is supposed to be illegal to traffic in I ivory or to trade ivory it is done all the time so the kenyan government had to guard it 24 hours a day and they decided to do this incredibly brave and it, gesture it was this woman who's speaking right now on winnie the, carew on, she's a wildlife biologist and it was really her idea to say we should make a statement to the whole world and what can we do that would get the whole world's attention about the plight of the elephants and the fact that they are being killed for their ivory um, and sold all around the world. It's not a local problem. This is a problem that is driven by markets in, um, all, uh, all in North America and, and not just in, in Africa. Um, so, it was her idea uh, to pile up all of these piles of ivory, thousands and thousands of, of tusks that represent a, an incredible tragedy, all of these incredible majestic beasts who died. Um, and these are what remains, the tusks that the government was able to, to you know, hive off from, from the poaching stream. And her idea was to burn it and to invite as many media and as many cameras as would possibly come. Um, and because it's such a, a powerful image, that this idea of burning ivory tusks, it got a lot of attention. And what looks like uh, an incredibly sort of apocalyptic act and moment is actually an act of hope. I'll, I'll cue it up if you want to talk about it, some of it's, that. It's also an act of hope because, and this is what I was going back to about, we. we these places are not far away from us. And we also can't externalize the blame and say, well, why are those poachers going and killing those elephants? Well, some of those poachers are paid very little. They're incredibly, they do not have a lot of resources. They want to feed their families. There are middlemen who make a lot of money. And then there's the market of people who will actually buy that. So it's it's very difficult to judge somebody who who's whose alternative is either starvation or, or poaching. So we have to be careful about our, our judgments. On the other hand, Winnie Carew's argument and the argument of Stop Ivory, which was one of the organizations that, that helped to uh, plan this burn, their argument is there is no such thing as a legal market for ivory, because as soon as there is a legal market, there will always be an illegal market. So let's just say, there is no market for ivory, period. Ivory belongs to elephants. Ivory does not belong you know, in trinkets that people put on their mantle place or piano keys or any of these, these things that we do not need. Um, and we are willing to, to, to risk the extinction of this majestic species for a commodity. And so the burn, this ivory was worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. And Kenya is not a wealthy country, but they decided to do it. And it had a ripple effect where uh, countries such as the United States and China were, are strengthen, strengthening their laws against um, 
uh, it, the illegal import of ivory be, precisely because of this thing that happened. And it was very difficult to film. It was difficult to get into. This, this shot was taken with a drone camera and there were no drones allowed because uh, they, were, they were outlawed. Um, but at the last minute, Nick managed to get permission. I'm not quite sure how he did it. And so just at the end of the day, when there was no light left and we were losing the light, it wasn't going to happen anymore. They, they allowed you to fly the drone, correct? That is right. We were very lucky. President Kenyatta had left. They were mostly worried about security, um, but he had left and we had to get official permission from basically the president's office that it was okay. Cause we had been asking and the Canadian ambassador to Kenya was actually there with us and was helping us run around at the last minute with our cases and bring out the drone. I think I actually have a picture. Let me see if I can share it with you um, of us with the drone. Yeah, here we are. Let me just see if I can share this quickly. If anyone's interested. Yeah, there we go. Dying light just managed to to get it in the end and it was really good because it ended up it's the beginning of the film it's an installation in the museum show a, a, a video installation it's one of our augmented reality sculptures in the museum show and it is also the scene that ends uh, the film because it was such a powerful moment and a real sort of metaphor um for uh the challenge of something like a species extinction, but also the hopefulness and the, the, the possible solutions um, for raising awareness. So that's about 20 minutes. And Jesse, if I'm correct, it's time to switch gears and we would love to hear anyone's thoughts about species extinction or human questions. impact on the planet. We would love to hear any questions about any of these things. We're not scientists or experts, um, but we did immerse ourselves in this topic for a number of years. So we'll do our best to answer anything you guys want to ask. Fantastic. Well, Jen and Nick, thank you so, so much for an amazing presentation. You guys highlighted a bunch of things in your talk that a lot of people haven't uh, done so far, which is the fact that zoos play such a fundamental role in conservation. The fact that individual poachers are not necessarily evil. This is a situation where there aren't necessarily bad guys on site in countries. And it's, it's a broader issue that needs to be addressed. And so thank you so, so much for that. So yes, we've got a bunch of families joining live uh, and uh, Ms. Huxley representing her entire class in Brampton. So welcome in everyone. I see all your hands up, so I will come to every group. Uh, you don't need to keep your hands up, I promise. We've also got a bunch of people tuning in on YouTube. So you guys can type in questions in the chat bar. Let me know where you're joining from and I will share as many questions as possible. But let's start with Sarah's group in Squamish, BC. Take us away if you have a question and uh, yeah, go for it. Let's just unmute your mic. Oh, there you go. You should be good to go. Why do they like, um, what do um, different like countries. Um, countries like use the elephant thing? What do they use ivory for, tusk for? Yeah. Well, a number of different things. I mean, uh, ivory was used for carvings. It's used to make, you know, um, uh, little sculptures and things like that. It was used uh, around the world, most predominantly for pianos at one point to create pianos. Uh, the piano keys in most old pianos are made of ivory. It's also used like rhino horn in some, oh yeah, it, can you show them that? Um, in some medicinal, uh, uh, some traditional medicine uh, contexts. And one of the things that people who are trying to protect rhinos try to say is that rhino horn is basically made from keratin which is the same thing that is your fingernail. So, you know, I don't know, I bite my nails, I must say that as a person, and I, I, I that's when I've, I've bitten them for years. I wish I didn't, I can't, get rid, I can't get rid of that bad habit, but I don't see, there are no health benefits from doing so. I can tell you that uh, myself, I have noticed that. So part of it is an education um, campaign to let people know that something like rhino horn really um, it, 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 it is not, considered medicine. So it's used, it's used for that too. And we, we can show you, why don't you play that scene? Um, th there's a scene, there's no audio, oh, we so don't have any, well, no, but I just want to show some of the, the there are incredibly elaborate I structures. Just, I just spotted through. Yeah, okay. Them, yeah. Okay, so elaborate structures, but interestingly, these things that you think of are elephant ivory are in fact 
mammoth ivory um, that this particular person has used instead of elephant ivory because it is not illegal to use. And the irony there is that the only reason the woolly mammoth ivory is available is because of the tundra and permafrost melting um, so that the, these, these tusks are now being revealed and, and used. Uh, it's better that they're not killing elephants for ivory, but of course it highlights another problem. Yeah. It's, it's almost like the ancestors of the elephants are reaching from back in time to try and help their, their um, you know, relatives who are alive today by taking the pressure off some of those markets while the awareness gets raised and while the laws get strengthened to try and stop um, the international trade in elephant ivory. What a poetic thought. Thank you guys so much for that. Also, it's the first time we've ever had a married couple live on one of these programs and I love your dynamic, so it's a lot of fun for me. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, uh, Megan's group also joining, I do believe in Squamish. Yeah, we got the Squamish gang today. Uh, so if you guys wanna come up with a question, go for it. What could we do to help stop poaching? Yeah. Wow, it's, it's a really good question. And it ties back into what I was trying to say before about how even though it seems far away, you can actually make a difference. I mean, poaching itself for something like um, uh, African elephants, uh, there's maybe not a whole lot you can change in your day to day that might help that, like it might help some other things. But one of the things we, we always tried to think about um, while we were making this project is how, how can we make a difference um, uh, in our individual lives, but also collectively. And for some of us, as soon as you become aware of an injustice or an issue that you care about, that you feel bad about somewhere in the world, you kind of have to think, boy, how, how much of what I have especially those of us who have a lot of privilege, if we live in Canada, if we, you know, live in a, a nice house, we don't have to worry about food, you know, we have some extra, let's face it, a lot of us um, that we can give to these issues. Jennifer and I do some of that by making films um, about these issues to try and raise, raise awareness, but we also try and support other groups. You know, if we really, you know, cared so much about something, maybe we would give up our jobs and just go and volunteer or try and live there and try and help local people who are doing that. We are not gonna do that. That's a sort of decision that we've made. But one thing we do try and do is support groups that have those people who have um, dedicated their lives to that. And so, the, for, for example, Dr. Winnie Carew and yeah, Stop Ivory. Yeah, Stop Ivory. If you look up Stop Ivory, you can see their website and they have org, I think. What, what, what ways you can support. And it's about raising awareness of people who, you know, some people might not even know that that little trinket that they inherited is something that's made of ivory. Raising awareness with your peers in your schools and, and supporting them by recognizing that even though we live on the other side of the world, there is something that we can do. We can support them financially. You know, you can give donations to them. And, and one of the things that we do when Nick says we're not gonna, you know, run away and uh, don't, don't be so sure that that's not gonna happen at some point, um, who knows, we're, it's still possible, but um, we make films for a lot of these organizations because it's expensive to do that kind of thing. And they often don't have a, a lot of resources. So our um, charity work or what we call pro bono is often doing um, uh, pieces or, or getting the word out that way in, in an audio visual way to help them spread their message. So you should look at, at their site and you should also go to, to the site of, of the zoos that are in your area. Like I don't know whether it's a Vancouver Aquarium or something and, and see what kind of conservation work they are doing. And you might be able to volunteer there in the summer and do um, some kind of work and learn about the conservation work. Um, that p places in you know zoos that are in your um, area are doing and and remember too that anyone who has um, an Instagram account or any kind of social media presence is in a way a filmmaker and a publisher and a disseminator of information in a way that can build community so even posting something about an issue like this to your friends and followers is a step in the right direction to raising awareness, you know, and you can take that 
as, as far as you want to. Maybe you try and uh, start a campaign for, for likes or for, uh, you know, some sort of critical mass of, of awareness for these things. And then that helps to drive awareness and other people might go and check out the website or the Instagram account of Old Pajetta Conservancy or the Zoological Society of London or Stop, or Stop Ivory or something like that. Do, do, do you guys have Snapchat? Are you Snapchat? Any Snapchatters? Yes, we got a few. Yeah. <laughs> when, when we started this whole thing, I was so, I wanted to make Snapchat filters of all of the endangered species that are in our film so that we could do Anthropocene Snapchat and you could become those species and it was too complicated and we couldn't do it. But who knows, maybe, maybe in the future. Well, fantastic, guys, and, and thank you for highlighting all sorts of uh, amazing projects. I've passed along Stop Ivory in the YouTube chat. I'll share it to all our, uh, our families at the end as well. And for the Squamish and Ontario groups, yes, Toronto Zoo, Ripley's Aquarium, Vancouver Aquarium, these are organizations that are doing conservation work and sharing those things out right now for kids at home. Uh, in fact, we're going to be doing PD sessions uh, featuring their work in the next coming week. So look for that, too. Thank you so much, guys. All right, Carolyn and Sharon, I'm gonna to come to you guys in a minute live. I wanna take a few quick YouTube questions uh, before we do. So the Young family who has been joining us for, I swear, every single project over the last month and a half, um, they wanted to ask, what is your favorite part of your job? No pressure. <laughs> what a great question. Um, I, I would, you know, think that, um, uh, I, in a way, can get paid to do the thing that I love to do, which is I, I do a lot of the camera work. I'm the cinematographer. And to me, to set my alarm for 3.45 in the morning and wake up when it's and go out when it's cold and dark and hike to the top of the mountain and wait for the perfect light and the sunrise, um, some people would say that's like an idea of a of a bad dream. And for me, I absolutely love that. Um, so I, I think being able to um, feel like my job uh, makes uh, hopefully a difference to things that, that I care about is the best thing about my job. You know, I have two things. One is that when we travel, and you can imagine that we go all over the world, and for this film, this project, this whole project, we were on every single continent except Antarctica. So that's a lot of places. And wherever we go, we get to kind of be behind the scenes. We're not going to the tourist attractions of these places. We're going to the mines and the dams and the you know, the, the flood office inside of Venice that is, going, that is determining every day whether they're gonna ring the, you know, uh, sound the alarms to say that, say that, that Venice is gonna flood. And it gives us this incredibly privileged way of interacting with these different environments. And I feel really lucky that we get to do that because, you know, being traveling around the world and thinking that you can film something about a place that you're not from um, can be something that is very arrogant. It can be something that is not, um, you have to have the right attitude. And so I love that part of my job. And I'm the one, as Nick is the one who is behind the camera, I'm the one who sits in the edit room with our editor for a year after we finish filming and goes through hundreds of hours of footage trying to put the story together. And it's like having a massive 2000 piece puzzle but never getting to see the picture of what that puzzle is supposed to be at the end before you start. So it's like a mystery story. And I love doing that because um, it's fascinating the way that that, that that happens, the editing process. Yeah. I think that was the deepest and most thoughtful answer to that question we've had in the last few weeks. So thank you so, so much for that. And uh, for everyone at home too, I really do encourage you to check out the documentary, check out their website. I've linked all these in the chat bar. I'll share them with our families, but there's some really amazing stuff that you can check out there. So I, I encourage that highly. All right, we're going to take two more questions. Uh, this one from Leslie. She's a teacher that's joined us for a lot of our projects in the past. She wanted to know, given your experiences, what are your thoughts on ecosystem services? So for the families at home, this is the idea of saying, okay, there is value in the environment, there's value in these services that the environment provides, um, and that's a monetary value we can put on that. Has the introduction of this as a concept resulted in any real change? Now, this is a deep question. We could probably do a whole other talk just on it, uh, but in your experience, if there's something you can share on that, that would be great. 
We'll, we'll try and be quick because we know we're running out of time. You want to talk about BC? Well, so there's a couple of things there. I mean, one of one of the, the answers to extinction and for these organizations in Africa is to say the services that a live elephant can provide over the course of, 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 of an elephant's life um, are, are, are so much more vast than the ivory and what the ivory is worth. And that is something, I guess, part of me feels like it, it, when when you have to bring everything down to the level of money, where it has to be, you have to you know measure everything in terms of money. I wish we didn't always have to do that, but we were in BC, where I am from BC, and we have Squamish people there. Um, we went into clear cuts that were absolutely devastating, and I'm talking about uh, old growth trees that are being cut for lumber, and they're not even being processed in BC. They're being shipped off as raw log experts, which means that the, the, the tree is not even being prepared in, in the province so that there's more value uh, to cutting it down. They're being shipped off to other countries. And I don't know if any of you read the Lorax um, at some point in your history, but it's basically a Lorax mentality, right? You know, we'll, we'll just cut everything down until it's all gone. Um, and, and, then, and then what do we do? And we have this spindly second growth. And I feel like if you look at the ecosystem services that an old growth tree provides or an old growth forest in terms of the whole world, basically, and climate, that I cannot believe that these are not more um, commonplace in terms of the conversations that governments and corporations are having, and especially in this pandemic crisis that we're having right now, where we're on the brink of, you know, we have a commodity oil that is, it's bottomed up, nobody's using it, so it's not worth anything right now. Isn't this the perfect time for us to switch to green energy and to green energy um, that we can support, that we can investigate, that we can start ramping up? Um, and yet the lobby of these, you know, uh, uh, people, the corporations that push oil is so strong that I don't know if it's going to happen. But I, I do love the, the positive element to this at the beginning. And this is something that I love with ecosystem services and recognizing the value of things in place. So we've dealt with people talking about mountain gorillas in Rwanda and Uganda, Costa Rica, Galapagos, these amazing places that have really committed to showcasing their resources and animals in a way that ecotourism becomes the main draw in a regulated, well done way. I mean, you look at mountain gorillas and their population has, I believe, doubled in the last 30 years because of this effort. And so I, I want to make sure that we get that positive story in too. And I'm glad you guys highlighted that, especially with ivory, which is a very dark thing as well. Um, this is great, guys. We're going to wrap up with a question from uh, Ms. Huxley. So thank you so much for joining us today, Sharon. And if you have a question from one of your students, uh, take us away. Okay. So my students are basically 10 years old, 10, 11 years old. So over the last 10 years, um, have you seen a, a large change shift in conservation efforts um, as a result of these awareness campaigns that are you know, happening in all around the world, as well as your Anthropocene uh, project? Yeah, great question. I think it's, it's such a great question, and it's really hard to have a credible overview when, you, when you're doing a project like this, because you're so immersed in it that you're in kind of a kind of a bubble um, and on this project in a way we deliberately sought out areas that represent the worst of of our challenges the most environmentally devastated the biggest mines and extraction sites and even though you know we we went for what could be hugely depressing all of us on the team um, still had lots of reasons for hope and it was sometimes just the dignity and the humanity of people who were living their lives in places that were extremely difficult. Um, and a lot of times it was people who were highly motivated, highly energized, who were working for change, um, who, were, who were organized to have a positive answer to the negative of, of whatever the challenge was. And so, um, you know, our, are the trends still in, in general in the wrong direction on, on the planet? I would say yes. And yet it feels like um, there is this kind of groundswell because there has to be for a number of these things of awareness and of activism and, and of, of change. 
uh, that I think gives us hope. Um, so, I mean, now we're in this really interesting time where there's a, another kind of global crisis um, and a, a crisis can catalyze, it can speed up a lot of processes. So I think now more than ever, people who think um, that, uh, you know, th that want to follow the solutions to a lot of our environmental problems and problems like extinction and climate change, um, I think it's time for us to be more vocal than ever, more active than ever, uh, so that the opposite doesn't happen. And people who want to keep the status quo or who stand to gain from, from some of these processes around energy, like Jennifer was saying, uh, that are detrimental, um, to not give them the upper hand. So when we think about coming out of this pandemic, can we speed up? Can we use it as a, as a catalyst and a, and a speeder upper or up, positive change. Of, of a lot of these positive things? And I really think we can. I, I think there's a lot of awareness around the world. Remember in the, in the last, the narration at the very end of the film says that again, as a species, we haven't been around very long, but we've had a tremendous impact on the planet. And yet we have the ingenuity as a species. If you look at civilization, if you look at the way that we can cooperate when we do cooperate across nations, um, across the world, we have the capacity to turn things around. There is no question about that. What we need is the collective will to do so. And the more of us who come together in, as Nick said, supporting the collectives that are working for positive change and making the small gestures and changes in our own lives that collectively make up a huge difference. You know, not, not using plastic, not using single use plastic, um, thinking about where our food comes from, thinking about riding our bikes to school instead of getting in the car. Those kind of things make an enormous change if we all do them together. So it really is a combination um, of supporting others and, and doing the work ourselves. Amazing. Well, thank you so, so much, Nick and Jen, for that positive message. I couldn't think of a better ending if I tried. And it's so nice for the kids that are tuning in because it's literally your generation. I think everyone assumed it was going to be my generation that was going to sort of lead the charge for, for making these changes. And it's not. Look at what Greta has done. Look at these million person marches around the world leading into this crisis. And now, I mean, I, I think that we really are in a situation where it will be a driver for even more change and recognition of the power of community to do great things together. So... With that, um, Nick and Jen, again, thank you so, so much. Michelle, thank you for the message at the beginning. What we do at the end of every broadcast is I'm gonna demute the microphones of Megan, Sarah, and Sharon's groups. If you guys could join me in saying a thank you to Nick and Jen for joining us today. You are all now demuted. Go for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you guys. For tuning in, guys. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Stay, stay safe, everybody. Bye. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so, so much for everyone for joining uh, on YouTube, too. Check out those resources for our live families. I'll share them in a minute. Nick and Jen, we really appreciate you being here today, and thank you so, so much. Take Cheers. care. All right. Have a nice day.